grateful to the Academy for accepting my donation and for their commitment to preserving my collection and making it accessible for future generations. And I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. So uh, here we are in the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences under the Oscars celebrating Kung Fu films uh, for the 40th anniversary of Enter the Dragon, hosted by the Academy. You must all be incredibly psyched to be witnessing this. I mean, this is kind of a remarkable thing. I, I want to take just a minute to try to put this in a little historical and cultural perspective. I would say, probably over the age of five, everyone in the world today knows who Bruce Lee is. Everybody knows what Kung Fu is. Uh, I've seen people in the most remote corners of the earth pulling Kung Fu moves and making Bruce Lee sounds. I've been to places like Sadr City in Baghdad and rural Transylvania where people have never seen an Asian person before and little kids will run up to me and say, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee. <laughs> <laughs> when you watch The Matrix and they take the plug out of the back of Neo's head and he says, I know Kung Fu. We all know what that means. But 45 years ago, just before all these posters that you've seen and before this movie was made, no one outside of Chinatown or martial arts circles knew what Kung Fu was. And Bruce Lee was just another martial arts teacher, an out of work TV actor whose show was canceled, struggling to make a living. So what happened? Within five years, Kung Fu had exploded onto our cultural landscape. There was a TV series, there were disco songs, bubblegum cards, there was a Hanna-Barbera cartoon on Saturday morning, Elvis did martial arts on stage. As one of our panelists here said, suddenly there was a kung fu studio in every small town in America. Parents took their kids to martial arts on Saturday morning like they were taken in a baseball practice. This all seems really normal to us all now, but this was completely new and strange in 1973. Kung Fu films didn't just change the way Hollywood worked, how we made action films, how we perceived and marketed foreign films. They also changed the way this country looked at Asians and all minorities. In the 1960s, we were still making yellow face movies in Hollywood. Mickey Rooney played a caricature Japanese in Breakfast at Tiffany's with big fake buck teeth and a crazy accent. Christopher Lee was still playing the insidious evil Dr. Fu Manchu. Tony Randall played Dr. Lau with his eyes taped up, you know, mincing around with the, with the fake, you know, cue. And Bruce Lee played a butler. He was a kick-ass kung fu butler, but still, he was relegated to the role of a Chinese butler. So, butlers, buffoons, insidious villains, this was kind of the lay of the land for Asian American actors. Now, if you go downstairs afterwards and you see the poster for the re-release of Green Hornet when it was cut together into a movie and released in 1974 after End of the Dragon, you'll see that 10 years after the TV series, Bruce Lee now gets top billing. Bruce Lee's name is huge. It's like a third of the size of the poster. There are three Bruce Lees in the poster and, and Van Williams is about this big. So what happened in those five years? Uh, the simple answer, and history is not always simple, but the simple answer is that Bruce Lee happened. Bruce Lee didn't invent the kung fu film. Chinese filmmakers have been making kung fu films since the silent film era. You could say that martial arts films are to China and to Hong Kong what westerns are to America and Hollywood. It's the genre that is uniquely Chinese. It, it particularly embodies Chinese ideals and culture. Bruce Lee. I'm, I'm sure you all know, was actually a, a, a pretty big child star in Hong Kong, in the Hong Kong film industry. But it was his hope and dream to become a global star in Hollywood. And for those of us in this room, in this business, I think what is particularly interesting is that Hollywood couldn't figure out what to do with Bruce Lee. When Bruce Lee said he wanted to be a bigger star than his friends James Coburn and Steve McQueen, they laughed at him. Uh, not to his face, but, <laughs> but they laughed at him. Bruce Lee knew all these people. He knew people at the very center of our business. He knew the biggest movie stars in the world. He knew film producers. He knew the head of a major studio, Warner Brothers. I don't know if you know this, but Roman Polanski hired Bruce Lee to be his fitness trainer. These people respected his talents. They recognized his charisma, but there was a belief, and it's amazing because it's actually memorialized in internal memos, that there was simply no way a person 
of color could ever be a movie star, a major box office draw. That's not the most remarkable thing about the story. I think the most remarkable thing is that Bruce Lee, despite this, persevered, endured, and found a way to show his talent to the world. In 1972, Raymond Chow, the owner of Golden Harvest, hired a foreign sales rep to take the first two Bruce Lee films, The Big Boss and Fist of Fury Can. He knew he had something special, and he wanted to sell foreign rights. But that year, they had only one buyer, a distributor in Lebanon. So the first people who saw Bruce Lee outside of Hong Kong in those films were people in Beirut. In 1972, on the eve of the Civil War, for two weeks in two theaters. Uh, if you go downstairs, I think we have one of the two surviving posters downstairs. The next year, the same sales agent came back to Cannes. He told me that there were so many people trying to buy the Bruce Lee films that they had to buy a circus tent because there were hundreds of people trying to beat a pass to their door. He said to me that a young kid named Bob Shea begged him to sell the U.S. rights. A kid in his 20s, but a major studio beat him out. So Bob Shea had to go buy a Japanese film that he called The Street Fighter when he released it here to launch his new company, New Line. Posters downstairs too, along with the original Bruce Lee posters from Hong Kong. The huge success of the Bruce Lee films in Asia and then around the world caused Hollywood to take notice. And to Hollywood's credit, they did what Hollywood does best. They instantly changed course 180 degrees, <laughs> showed Bruce their love, and got ahead of the wave. So Warner Brothers reached out to Raymond Chow and to Bruce Lee to a co-production, which would become the movie you're going to see tonight, End of the Dragon. There were variety stories about Hollywood producers crowding the flights to Hong Kong with suitcases full of money looking for film rights to acquire. And overnight, and this is amazing, between 1972 and 1973, nearly 20% of the films released in American theaters were kung fu films. Ooh quickly dubbed kung fu films, some of which were unbelievably bad, <laughs> and I'm sure you've all seen them. But a whole new genre was born, at least for America, right? The martial arts film, the action film. And I think also, action films in America would never be the same again. Uh, I, you know, it's, it's so long ago now that maybe some of you don't remember what fights used to look like in, in Hollywood films, but if you watch Star Trek and you see Captain Kirk, fighting big puppet aliens and, you know, foam costumes and flailing around. John Wayne was still an action star in 1972-73 with McHugh. And if you see those big punches and the air whiffs and people stumbling around, I mean, it looks like mimes, you know, jumping around, fighting each other. After Bruce Lee, there was no way anybody could ever sell that kind of fighting again. There are a lot of stories about this moment in time. Your panelists will probably tell you a few, but I want to just share one with you that I found um, in the Warner Brothers archives. You know, if you look at the picture of the Warner Brothers marketing department in 1973, it looks like the cast of the Lawrence Welk show. They, it was like Opie and Harriet at Warner Brothers, and they were tasked with releasing these new movies that came from Hong Kong that were in Chinese, that had guys jumping around and screaming and hacking each other. They had no idea what to do with it. And in the file, in the marketing file, I found a clipping from the New York Times about a Warner Brothers screening in Harlem of Five Fingers of Death. During the film, someone came into the theater with a 22 pistol and tried to rob the concession stand, and five members of the audience, incredibly amped up after seeing their first cut of death, ran out, beat the guy up, unarmed, took his gun away from him, and helped him until the police arrived. <laughs> best thing, the punchline for me is the Warner Brothers marketing department put a note in the clipping saying, what do we do with this? Should we, should we release a press release? Is this a press release? Should we, should we call in the press about this? The most profound change, I think, about, for me, and the reason why I collected these, these posters, particularly through the 70s and 80s when they were being thrown out and no one was particularly interested in hanging on to them, particularly the non-Bruce Lee ones, is that they really made Americans reassess how we look at Asian Americans and at minorities. Bruce Lee became an inspiration, not just to me, but to generations of young minority actors, musicians, filmmakers, martial artists, not just because of his physical mastery, but because of his powerful defiance, his innate dignity, his grace, and his passion. Bruce Lee refused to be belittled, he refused to be marginalized, and he refused to be dismissed. He commanded our attention. He commanded the frame. He demanded respect. 
He had a power and magnetism that few people have ever had. Today, 45 years later, if I showed a picture of Steve McQueen or James Coburn or those kids in Satter City, they would have no idea who they were. But if I showed them a picture of Bruce Lee with his nunchucks from End of the Dragon, they would all say, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee. This is why I love kung fu films. Many, many of them are terrible. Many of them are comically bad and enjoyable for that reason. Very few of them rise to the level of the film you're about to see tonight. But kung fu films changed America and they changed the world. So I want to say thank you, Bruce Lee. Thank you, the producers of End of the Dragon. Thank you, the Hong Kong film industry and Warner Brothers. All the kung fu practitioners who toiled in obscurity and suffered making these films. And I want to thank the Academy for preserving these posters from this very special moment in our history. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. That was terrific. Um, you've all been handed a printed program that lists the um, biographies and, and credits of some of our guests. So in the interest of time, because I know we all want to get to the film, uh, I will only mention uh, the bio of our last guest because he is not in your program. Uh, but first, if you will do me a favor and welcome uh, one of the producers of Enter the Dragon, Paul Heller. Another producer of uh, Enter the Dragon, Mr. Fred Weintraub. Fred? <laughs> the cinematographer of Enter the Dragon, Mr. Gilbert Hubs. He plays uh, O'Hara in the film, Mr. Bob Wall. <laughs> he stars as Roper in the film, Mr. John Saxon. to have a member of uh, Bruce Lee's family here, his daughter, Shannon. <laughs> Our next guest has written more than 100 scores for film and television, has won four Grammy Awards with 21 nominations and six Oscar nominations for Cool Hand Luke, The Fox, Voyage of the Dam, The Amityville Horror, and The Competition, and The Sting, too, rather. Please welcome Mr. Lalo Schiffer. My credit would be the four-year-old that was running around on the set. <laughs> uh, so, uh, looking back all these years, uh, your father died when you were very young, and yet he uh, lives on in this legacy. Uh, what does that bring to you and your family? 
Um, you know, it's really phenomenal, and it's such an absolute gift uh, to me and to so many other people. Uh, when I travel the world, uh, so many people, you know, everywhere, they know who my father is, and they've been touched in some way, inspired in some way, or just excited in some way. And uh, it, it's such a blessing, um, and amazing, really. I mean, you know, I now work um, doing things for the legacy for through our, my foundation and through our licensing business and that sort of thing, but honestly, I mean, for 40 years, it's been going on and on without and needing any help from me, really, and um, I'm just so amazed and so inspired on a daily basis, and it's really why I want to do what I do in keeping the legacy alive, because I'm inspired by it. If, you know, there hadn't been that depth of philosophy behind it, if there hadn't been so much more to it and so much authenticity to it, I don't know that I'd be doing what I'm doing today. But I feel absolutely blessed and absolutely empowered to continue the message of his life. Paul and Fred, I want to start with you so that if we can go back a little bit. Stephen kind of painted the picture a little bit for us, uh, but I think it really is hard for us to really remember, uh, and certainly for those younger who weren't around in 1973, it's really uh, almost impossible to believe uh, how incredibly singular this, this film was and how, what a breakthrough it was. Um, can you talk a little bit about the struggles you guys had to, to get this film made and to get it on the screen? I'd, I'd, like, to cor I'd like to correct a little bit of the history. Uh, Bruce, we ran into, Freddie has the greatest eye for talent of any human being I know. <laughs> Fred ran into Bruce. Bruce, we were both executives at Warner Brothers at the time. Sterling Sillip and James Coburn all kept telling us about Bruce Lee. Fred had the insight to develop a screenplay for him called Way of the Tiger, Sign of the Dragon, which ended up as the TV series Kung Fu, but it was written for Bruce. <laughs> Nobody would pay it any mind. We saw... I mean, Freddie, you have to talk about this too. We saw the success that Bruce gave up in Hollywood. He was just in despair and he couldn't get arrested. Went back to Hong Kong with Raymond and did two pictures that turned him into bigger than the Beatles, bigger than Elvis. And Freddie again said, okay, let's finally do something with Bruce. And we did. We came together. We put together a story. We hired a young writer, Michael Allen, who's sorry he's not here tonight. And we came up with a screenplay for Bruce. And, uh, uh, nobody was interested in it except us. <laughs> and, but Freddie went over to Hong Kong and convinced Bruce to make it in spite of Raymond Chow. <laughs> Raymond was having such a success with his Chinese films with Bruce, he didn't want him to do an international film. He thought it might diminish his stature if it wasn't good. So, you take it, then. Firstly, you gotta separate the picture and Bruce Lee right. in a funny way. Uh, Bruce's shooting style was magnificent. He had that charisma. Somewhere in it, you could tell that this was, something was gonna happen with him. It wasn't happening. He was having a lot of problems and a lot of difficulty. But the result was an unusual performance and something that uh, we can't compare to today. As uh, we heard from Stephen Chin that all over the world when he talked about Bruce Lee. But what the other part that goes to this is really for those people who are in this business and think that somehow it all is so easy and wonderful, and it really is. If you know absolutely nothing <laughs> and you keep pushing forward and you have an idea and you don't let anybody stop you, something happens. Bruce was a friend of mine. He tried. I, I had already had two people when I was in New York write the script, as Paul said, 
and it became Kung Fu, and then I had written another script called Kelsey for Lee and a guy named um, uh, Woody, Strode. Woody Strode, right? Mm -hmm. And then Paul and I, who had gotten together, uh, began to talk serious about this. And we got nowhere. And I, and I tell you why we got nowhere, because he was an agent, and just, you know, he looked at you with a blank eye. And luckily, the, the people who helped us are very much forgotten, but, and, and, and they're studio executives. I mean, there was Steve Ross, there was Ted Ashley, there was Dick Letter, the head of advertising. There was the distribution, remember? Dick Barr. Dick Barr, who was really instrumental in helping us with the script and telling us why it's not releasable in Japan unless we take this out or take that out, and how much money. Uh, we actually made, what we had to do was get $200,000 from Warner Brothers. They didn't want any part of it. But when Bruce sent me and I asked him, I said, go and make something I can show. He sent me just some of the action footage from Big Bruce, and I showed it to Ted Ashley, and he said, okay, okay, get them part of it, you know. And, and, and when I went over to Hong Kong and talked to Bruce, Bruce was, of course, an enormous star by then. Raymond did not want to let him go. And um, he did, because Bruce was going to be an international star. I came back. And to all these blank stairs, we had a script, we had everything going, but nobody wanted to make this, this picture. Yeah. And finally, uh, Ted Ashley gave us the okay. And Paul and I then started working hard on the script and brought Bruce here. And, and uh, never, never, never did we know when the picture started to go. Bruce did all the stunts. He was not really involved in the making of the whole movie or the complete story. He did add parts of it which were good. But the, the, all of a sudden, uh, uh, a cinematographer never shot 35. 35. <laughs> Over here, Gil. Gil. Yeah. And, and uh, Bob Klaus, a very underrated director. And the people from Warner Brothers, from Dick Letter of the Advertising, and Leo Greenfield, they all had to adjust their minds to something that they didn't understand. Mm -hmm. And it was a very, very wild time. I mean, even when we were making it, there are hundreds of stories. And of course, you know, this is where everybody's got a million stories about this. You know, it's like when I did Woodstock. I haven't met anybody yet who wasn't at Woodstock. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the answer is, but this picture, we made it for three, four hundred uh, thousand dollars. And, and uh, they chipped in, in in foreign. And we had something that was very helpful for us. We learned, Paul and I, how to deal with other countries and other people. And they were excellent. And they really helped. And that led to the fact that I, I, I know I, I could shoot all over the world. I shot in all the emerging nation countries. I shot four more pictures in our country. Paul shot all over the world. I mean, we learned to take advantage that people love films and there were great artists all over the country. Mm -hmm. And one of the major things that made Enter the Dragon work was the score. Listen to the score. I turned around to him. I turned around to In those days, the way you listen, you had a composer, and he'd come over, play the piano, and go boom, 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 boom. How does that sound? And you'd, you'd shake your head as a producer and not know until finally you saw the whole orchestra and you could make a few comments. But with them. With, 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 um, Lalo. With Lalo, I said, I want an American music, but with a Chinese, no, I don't want a Chinese, I want an American, give me some idea. And it was so great that I used it in extra places, you know, all along the way, because it was so good. So everybody played a little part, it was a, like coming into a center, with Bruce being this, you know, and, and everybody around. The distribution guys, they had never distributed. I told them, let's go to New York and, and, and it'll, it'll be a, a big hit. They didn't want to open it. But Leo Greenfield went ahead and he did it. And the Dick Letters and, the, and they Joe Himes. They, dragon parade. they gave yeah, us a I Dragon Parade, which would have never. And, and then it opened in Japan. And it did more business, all because Dick Martin had told me. Leave off any Japanese references. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't, you don't know how these happen. Up until then, most Chinese films had a Japanese villain. Yeah. 
and, and we still don't have a Japanese village. And it's the first kind and of the movie. hardest part we had was how do you make a movie with no guns? And then, you know, that, we sat around, we sat around 40 days trying to figure out how we can get an island. You know, whether, why would this island not be attacked? And, uh, but some of those kind of things were fun. But what was nice was all the people who surrounded I mean, was Andre Morgan in, in Hong Kong, and Raymond Chow, who was not on high the set eventually, but who was really very, very instrumental. Everybody participated. And of course, the stories of the movies being made, all these people can take. Sure, well, let's, let's get some more of uh, these stories. It's great. John, I'm interested in talking to you next, because uh, at the time this film was made, you, had, you were you'd gone, you were Stella Adler studying under Stella, am I right? I had worked with, with Stella Adler. Yeah, so, yeah. so I mean, you were. And Michael Chekhov as well. Right, so you were a class A actor. You, the, well, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Still very small, I might add. Uh, anyway, uh, and I think you were kind of known for that, you know, uh, very leading man type guy. So, how did you come to this project, and what was your uh, take on, uh, on well, this one? Well, I I had been doing things like uh, uh, judo and uh, uh, Japanese uh, karate and stuff like that, and and eventually I began to see other other kinds of things. And, uh, well, uh, some of you guys came and asked me to be in that film. We and I knew and, and, and you had talent. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but, but, you know, I had a moment when I decided, after I, I told you guys I was going to do the film, I said, I called Fred, and I said, Fred, I'm not sure I want to do this. <laughs> And uh, for, it was the longest silence that I've ever heard from Fred. <laughs> anyway, it, it only lasted about 15 minutes when I decided back to do the film, <laughs> luckily for me. And um, that's, that's when I began to, uh, well, I got uh, an order from you guys at Warner Brothers to go over and do that film. Yeah. So what do you remember about the production, especially the fight sequences and things like that? Or well, the fight sequences, what we were doing, well, Bruce uh, obviously helped me a good bit. And uh, I would ask him, what do, you, what do you think I'd try to do this kind of thing? He said, that's pretty good, try that. And we were working on that. <laughs> <laughs> he probably didn't mean it, but it, it, <laughs> but it, it worked uh, well enough for the film. You know? so we, was, then, was this an enjoyable film for you? Did you enjoy working on it? Or? Yeah, I want to tell you that, um, hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was enjoyable. <laughs> I'm, I'm writing some things here uh, that I've written uh, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, about Bruce and myself, you know? Yeah, if you can do that. But anyway, uh, I don't know how far I can go with that kind of stuff, but... Uh, uh, well, actually, one time I remember having a dream that I was walking to my car late at night, parked just below Hollywood Boulevard, and I had uh, to put my key in the, to open the door, and then all of a sudden the guy jumped up behind me and, 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 and had a gun at me, a very small gun, but he was pointing it to me, you know? And uh, I, I, I was wondering what to say, and he said, they, he said, give me those keys or I'll, 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 and then he stopped and he looked at me and he said, man, you're John Saxon. <laughs> what was it like working with Bruce Lee? <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> so did you get out of it? Did he leave you alone then? Or did, huh? you, did he continue to rob you? Or did you... Or did <laughs> It was a dream I had. Oh, it was a dream, okay. <laughs> a dream, and I told a dream that that had happened, you know? Uh, yeah, those are those, those places that I'm telling you about. Uh, <laughs> but, um, well, anyway, um, when, I, when I got the, to, to Hong Kong, uh, I was there with my wife and my son, who's not yet two years old, and the next day I went to see Bruce, and uh, he brought me into his house. He was waiting to see me. And um, we walked in, and I walked in 
to his house, and then I saw he had uh, a gem. Uh, uh, and, and I looked at it and it reminded me of what I had a little bit of at my home, you know? <laughs> and we began to talk this and that, and he was telling me things, uh, the, what he could do with kettlebells and stuff and things that I had little con contact with at that time. And we, we kept going on and on and on. And then all of a sudden, he, he began to tell me, um, show me, uh, show me how you do your sidekick. And I said, okay, but I had done a scene uh, at the park about a, two, uh, three weeks or four weeks prior where I had strained my, my ankle. And I said, oh, well, I'm, all right, he's wanting to do this for me, I'll do it, you know. So um, uh, all of a sudden, uh, I, I threw a kick. And then he said, let me show how I do mine. And he did. <laughs> he, he moved around with a chair. And I didn't know what he was doing, you know? I was looking over his shoulder like that. And all of a sudden, he stood in front of me for about 15 feet or something like that. And he did a hop, skip, and a jump. And hit out of back, you know? And he knocked me clear across <laughs> on my heels, like this, going into a chair like that. And the chair fell down and broke. <laughs> and I, I got up, Lynn, and I saw he was very kind of quiet and, and anxious about this. And I said, listen, uh, it's okay. I mean, uh, I didn't get hurt. I didn't get hurt. He says, I know, but that's my best chair. <laughs> and it was the same chair that he had everybody else do the same thing with me that I discovered later. You sit behind, you stand behind it, and then he kick, and you go back and boom. And I had broken it. I was the only one that had broken it. Okay. Anyway, so. Thank you very much. So, Gil, I'd like to talk to you because uh, one of the things that's very interesting about this is, is it's shot on location, and you have also this incredible sequence with mirrors that where it's it's a it's a very cinematic sequence. And I just wanted to talk to you about how that was shot and how you worked with the director to make that uh, work. It must have been a very challenging uh, a film for you. So, you want to talk a little bit? About that? It was, but uh, house was just a grand director. And he had a, a, a wonderful visual sense of thinking of things. And like the uh, mirrored room, I'm not sure where the idea came from, the original idea. It didn't come from any movie, I know that. Um, but, uh, but Bob really enhanced it. And, uh, and he also was tough. And he just, we had a lot of problems. We could talk to you about problems for problems. And there are a lot of funny stories, but Bob just, powered through it and uh, and also he was very good with Bruce he listened to Bruce he uh, tried to understand what Bruce wanted to do and then try to make it sim cinematic and so the mirrored room was an idea and um, uh, and we were in a uh, uh, restaurant one day and we saw these uh, vertical mirrors and I think his wife was with us and that came into the uh, into the picture, and I think Paul designed the set. And uh, so we got in it, and, and Bruce had given us uh, a couple of days off. He, he was away, so Bob was able to work out some shots in there. And it was very confusing. You couldn't stay in the mirror room for more than about 10 or 15 minutes. And when you were talking to somebody, you actually had to touch them. Because <laughs> Fred is sitting right here, but in the mirrored room, he wasn't. He was over there, and so uh, um, a lot of us kind of got sick, you know, being <laughs> but, uh, um, but Bob came up with this great idea to have the mirrored room, and well, we're going to see ourselves all over this, and he said, no, we'll build this closet right in the middle, put, put um, mirrors on the outside of it, and put the camera inside, and um, so uh, we got in the closet, and we had a couple stand-ins, and things just started to happen. But it was very difficult to repeat them because you had no grounding. You'd be setting up the shot and, and a head would come in. Oh, that'd be great. Just, just hit him and the person would hit the other way. And so Bruce found it very difficult and actually I think he 
at the mirror a couple times and, and had to go away for a little bit more. Uh, he cut himself. But, uh, but it was very confusing. But um, it actually, once we started shooting, it was easy. It was very hard. But the shots, there were a million shots in there. Terrific. Well, I look forward to seeing it on the big screen again. So thank you for being with us. Bob? I want to ask you, you're one of, uh, there's several, but you're one of the main villains in this piece, and I just wanted to ask you what that was like to, to be a villain in a Bruce Lee film and, and how that has affected uh, your life from, from <laughs> since then. And talk about making the film. Well, the strange part of it is that I love Bruce Lee, and we were really close friends for many, many, many years, uh, over 10, and training partners. And, um, and I got... 500 a week when I was making 10 to 12,000 a week in my real estate business. My wife of 44 years now said, why are you doing this? And I said, I just love Bruce. He's my first close Chinese friend. I can take these hits. And everybody's afraid of him. And I've been training with him. I can take the hits. And, and Bruce wanted to do everything real. He really, Freddie and Paul can tell you, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, Bruce got hurt a lot in this film. He got bit by the snake. He got hurt by the windows. He got cut with the glass scene with me. We were using real bottles. So uh, my part in it was I, I was really enjoying it. You, know, you don't see yourself as a bad guy, although my wife does. She thought it was a bad guy. <laughs> but what does she know after 44 years of married life? I'm a recovering whore for that long. But at any rate, uh, I, uh, I got a kick out of being his villain because I loved him so much and because he wanted to do everything real. Bruce Lee was a genius. And we have a few on this panel. I mean, the producers, for sure. Gil, and God, Lala, unbelievable. Uh, John, this cast and crew was just amazing and fun to work with. But I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot because I, could, I felt I could make Bruce look better because he could really hit me. So for example, in the bottle scene, in real bottles, and people don't realize you break the bottles, I got a, I got a fall in. I can't look down. I get cut and ruined a lot of uniforms doing that scene. But uh, Bruce said to me, I want you to try to stab my right peck. I want you to take the right bottle and break it. I want you to stab my right peck. That was my job. That's what he told me. I'm like, okay. Well, I was trying to stab his right peck. I got successful, almost. Uh, but he was a genius. He was a brilliant martial artist. He was so accurate. He hit you exactly where he was supposed to. So I really enjoyed being the bad guy. Well, I'm going home thinking I'm the good guy, but no. And I've had so many people over the years say, I hated you. I wanted to get. Even Freddie said, I wanted, I wanted him to kill you. <laughs> he didn't want to hire me for the part in the beginning. <laughs> but I really enjoyed doing it. I loved Bruce. And it was, it's like my partner for 48 years is Chuck Norris. And they're both the same, Chuck and Bruce. And people say, you've never missed a workout with either one of them. And I said, no, why would you miss a painting lesson from Picasso? They were, Bruce was a genius, and he was a brilliant martial artist. And the thing I like most people to know about him was he was so kind and funny. He was a magician. He was magic to be around. Intense, had a temper. Mm. <laughs> Being Irish, I don't have one much either. But <laughs> he was very loving and kind and intense. And, it, and I think Freddie and, and, and Paul and Linda his widow handled him so well, he was like a racehorse, you know. But uh, I truly enjoyed the beatings he gave me. And we had this one. <laughs> well, I, I'm going 900 against my wife, and I'm not going for 901, but <clears throat> I, I say, it's all the Bruce Lee movies I did, you got to run them backwards so I get a draw. But, but Bruce was amazing to work with because he was such a professional. He hit you exactly where he was supposed to, exactly what he was supposed to. And, uh, and so I really had a very, very good time being the villain. And I'm eternally glad that I did it because I think this is really, there's no question in my mind, it's the best martial arts film of all time. And it really, really, on the set, when John came, I was such a big fan. And I said, wow, that's a darn good actor. I mean, that's an amazing actor. I was. I just was like, wow, we got John Saxon. Anna Capri did a great part and was an excellent actress. But Freddie and, and Paul just did an amazing job of putting this whole thing together and then holding it together because Bruce was very nervous. 
And Gil, of course, I mean, I think he's just brilliant. Lalo, who's a martial artist, a black belt, and I think a genius. And so and I looked at the whole cast and crew, Jim Kelly, who I hired, I brought into the film, and Freddie. Uh, so we, we really had an amazing group of actors that, and martial artists who pulled off what Freddie and Paul's dream was. And, uh, and, and Bruce, of course, did his part, being the genius he was. He just was amazing. And God bless him for the 32 years we had him. Great. Well, you, brought, you are uh, coming up last here, but also probably one of the last in the process of putting this together, bringing the music in. Uh, could, what, what do you remember of where, what your inspiration was? I mean, this is a very delicate balance to make a film that uh, is coming out of Warner Brothers and yet at the same time wanted to have an authenticity for uh, the Kung Fu spirit. So what, what was your process for this? Well, please let them tell you first that Glenn and Paul, they were interested in my service, my contribution to the film and, and musically, but I have an agent. <laughs> a, a Hollywood agent who had to make the deal, and that was a problem. <laughs> But I don't know how they solved the problem, and all of a sudden, I was assigned to do the film. I was very, very happy about it. And I want to tell you that I'm never going to forget that particular day, because my son, Ryan, who is in the audience now, uh, he's a filmmaker. He did, he did several films, including one that is a horror film called Abominable, and I, I did the music for that too. Uh, the, I remember that Brian was born exactly when I was supposed to start doing the music of Enter the Dragon, <laughs> and that is a very great memory for me. So I waited until they finish the principal photography, the editing, and one of a sudden I went to spot it. I think I spotted with Fred and Paul. Spotting means the places, the spots in the film where music is going to go. It's not wall to wall, always in this case it almost, almost was. <laughs> no, but it was, it was, there are many moments in the dialogue or sound effects or something, and, and the music was taking care of the, not only the fights, but suspense, tension, getting to the fight, all, all, all the human problems that the music can contribute to. And we made the, the, the timings, and when I finally got the final timing, how much music is in this film, it was almost like one hour of music which is quite a lot. I mean, in those days, <laughs> and even today, I mean, 45 minutes of music in a film is quite a lot of music, and it takes, it would take normally between the composition and the orchestration and everything, it would take about several weeks to write the music for it. I'm talking weeks in which you are working day and night. It's not it's not just, uh, it's not a, like a union job. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is, you have to be working with day and night. And this is more than one hour of music. And all of a sudden, Fred and Paul called me and said that Bruce wants to meet me. Bruce Lee wants to meet me. I'm going to have lunch with me. This is way, they, 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 they have finished the principal photography, everything. That's why I could do the timings and all that. And they were, they said, yeah, you, you have to come to the commissary. He was in Warner Brothers. And you have to talk to him. I said, 
but I'm going to talk to him. <laughs> I mean, I, we come from different cultures, and I don't know if, if I'm going to understand. I like, I like very much martial arts, but I don't understand what we need to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> as, a of, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I said to Fred and Paul, this is your movie. I do want, you, you already have the, the, studio, the, 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 the recording studio booked, the engineer who's going to record it, everybody, but all the musicians, we have, we have like close, in, in, in some places we have close to us, 100 musicians, mm -hmm. symphony orchestra. And they were all called already, they had a day to come. And I said, you know, it takes me from Beverly Hills to, to Warner Brothers. It takes me at least one hour with, with the traffic and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and then to be there talking to Bruce, I don't know, we made two more or three more hours. <laughs> I, I, I'm wasting four hours. <laughs> time that I need. It's your music. It's your, it's your, it's your mood. You need it. And without me, it cannot be done. So no, you have to do it because he's asking. And all. So I went, and I went to the commissary, and I met, of course, of it, Bruce Lee, and the first thing he did is touch here. He was, he was iron. Iron. And he says, and he told me the whole story, how martial arts, he told me, started in India, where the monks needed, when they were going to the countryside, they were being attacked by bandits. And they developed what they call the empty hands form of self-defense. And then that form took, this is 5,000 5, years ago. See that, that made an evolution going from India to China. He got several other forms like Kung Fu. And, and then he went to Korea, Shotokan, Taekwondo. He uh, went to, to the, in, uh, Japan, Karate. And he said to me, Bruce, he said, I made possible these changes. I, my techniques are beyond. I went, I, I, I go beyond all those techniques. And I, I, I incorporate the best, and I make it a, a, a different kind of art, a different kind of martial art. So I said, oh, then we have something in common. Okay. Said, yeah, yeah, because the, the, the classical music I studied comes from Europe. <laughs> in 2,000 years. <laughs> And I also went beyond. <laughs> you most certainly did. Yes. <laughs> you most certainly did. And yeah. we'll hear that tonight, I think. Well, uh, well obviously, Bruce liked very much that. And that, that, was, that was it. And then, of course, of course, I was shown the movie and the, all the things. That, when somebody said, how, how is it possible? How did you write the musical? He said, how can you explain that? <laughs> but on the other hand, yes, you can explain it. When you have somebody like Bruce Lee, with his energy, and the way the, the movie was made by all these people here, the, the way the movie was made, it, it was contagious, the energy. And I translated that into music. To sounds. So that's it. And then, when it was being scored, for those of you who had the experience of being in the control room, in the mixing room, when a, when a picture is being scored and there are 90 musicians out in there and they're playing their hearts out, and it, you will never hear music this brilliantly again. I mean, they ha it's, it's like being enveloped in sound. And I looked at, at Lalo, and, and I said, this, 
this is just amazing. He said, it's like seeing your little girl in her first party dress. <laughs> <laughs> One more thing I have to add. I, I asked Bruce Lee, why do you want to leave? I'm, I'm very happy, he said, that you're going to write the music because in Hong Kong, in my dojo with Jim, when he practiced martial arts, he does it with a record. He, did, he used to do it with a record of Mission Impossible. <laughs> We want to memorialize this a little bit by taking a picture. Uh, so if you guys will all uh, st stand up and we'll uh, gather you together. Uh, and then we'll start the film. So just give us a second here. Thank you all for your patience.